and he's committed to introducing himself to our, to our neighbors, ourselves, and in his personal time, he is a very active member of his church and loves all Philadelphia sports teams, especially the Eagles. So thank you, Mr. George, for coming tonight. Um, and next to Mr. George, we have Ms. Carla Krull, Esquire. Um, Ms. Krull is a former teacher turned lawyer who is an alumni of Girls High, St. Joe's, and Drexel, both undergrad and law school. After teaching math for three years, one of the school district disciplinary schools, she moved to Japan for four and a half years. She returned to the United States determined to apply the knowledge and experience overseas to uplift the community of people that she had raised among. After graduating Drexel's Law School, where she was awarded the National Association of Women Lawyers Outstanding Student Award, she started a low Bono firm called Legal Empowerment Group, educating and representing those eligible for legal services. Ms. Krull has spent the last few years working on housing issues and speaking on racial justice. She is a mentor, MLCHAP charter, um, excuse me, board member, board secretary, and considers herself a servant leader. Currently, she is running for city council in District 4 C. Thank you, Ms. Krull, for coming and joining us today. All right, so if you've been a part of the King community, it's really hard to give Ms. Samuels a, an introduction um, because Ms. Samuels, um, her son Michael, uh, graduated last year and he was also one of my former students. But Ms. Samuels, Mike played football and she went in as the football extraordinaire plus, 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 plus. And all the pluses became um, part of raising money, football banquets, um, whatever she could possibly do to support the students here at King, from proms to dances to um, jobs and referrals and, and everything. So she just like needs like some honorary Martin Luther King plaque because even though Michael has graduated, she's still here doing work. So um, thank you, Ms. Samuel, for coming out today. Um, to the left, up uh, to the right of Ms. Samuels is Mr. Joseph Budd. Mr. Joseph Butt is, is concerned with not concerned. Okay, so <laughs> Mr. Bud, I met Mr. Bud actually um, this summer sitting in Uncle Bobby's and he was listening to me and some of my colleagues talk about education and he said, excuse me, I overhear y'all talking and um, you you work at Cuba School, you work at. So I work the King and some other colleagues work different places. He says, you know, we're doing some work in the community and we're at Roosevelt and we want to come into King. So I said, sure. Gave me his card and so we're start, we're having this partnership and well, he's already started this partnership of working with uh, the young people in the building. Um, you're working with the young men in particular. Um, so we welcome you and thank you for participating. Now, next to Mr. Bud is his extraordinary daughter, April. April Bud. Um, and April, so I, I didn't, I didn't get her bio, but April is like, I'm so impressed with her. I, I met her. Um, I don't know where. I don't remember. Book club, yeah, summer book club. Last year, um, we facilitate some book clubs, and April came, and uh, she's also a friend of my other colleague, and she was just really impressive. And she came back on Martin Luther King Day, and I had a forum here, and she participated. So I'm gonna let April tell you um, all the all the magnificent things you do. Like she's hashtag Black Girl Magic, so that personifies her. Uh, and then Mr. Gabe Bryant. My brother in the struggle, solidarity, fighting um, mass incarceration, um, the Bell Fund, uh, Black Lives Matter movement, uh, fighting against help with Move Nine. Like he's on the Malcolm X uh, grassroots movements. Like he's in all of the community grassroots spaces and places. So I can't even tell you like one thing that I don't know that you do. Like he just does all these amazing things. And you talk about somebody with their feet on the ground, his feet is in the, on the ground marching every single day and all the work that he does. So this is our panel that I bring to you this evening, with the students bring to you this evening. So can we give them a round of applause, please? So now I'm going to bring you 
the lovely Flora, who is your moderator, and then in between the, the questions, we'll do some of the closing comments, okay? Good evening. As we enter into warm weather, we can anticipate more acts of violence in our community. What do you believe are the underlying cause for the vast amount of violence that occurs in Germantown, West Oakland, Colorado, Area? In these communities, there's a lot of poverty, and with poverty, the people have to find their way. Like, and as you know, in the past, well, for what I know, projects are made, they were created as a social experiment. And so in these particular areas, there are projects and there are a lot of poverty going on. And of course, it'd be a lot of robbing, because it's a lot of robbing, and robbing leads to murder sometimes, because people are trying to survive because they don't have the jobs. Or the other resources that my son, ironically enough, very similar to Ms. Diamond for his senior project. For his senior project. <laughs> Let's get it. For his senior project, he did a very similar conversation, and it was the disparities between special admit and public schools. And in his research, what he learned was that the things that are missing at a Martin Luther King High School, at the Edison High School, at a South Philadelphia High School, are the things that unify and bring together not only young people, but the community, and more importantly, parental involvement. Um, one of the things he learned was you may not come out to hear if your son or daughter isn't doing well in school because you really don't want to hear that. But if they're in play, we don't have drama. If they're in a band, if there is an art exhibit, if there are other activities, then the school actually becomes a safe haven and a hub for opportunities for improvement. And that's why organizations like Men Who Care, who have been in work entirely, and that's why Mr. Gabe and all of the people on this panel and you are important because what we have is, to me, an epidemic of young people who have not been taught, poured into, supported, um, and exposed to differently, there are many children in King that haven't gone beyond Germantown. There are many children at King who haven't gone on a college tour, but we want them to believe and buy into that college is possible. There are many children at King who, had it not been for resources here brought in, would not have had SAT prep and things that are meaningful that allow them to see what is possible. So in many cases, to me, it looks like we don't expose you to what's possible, you don't know what's possible, and then we blame you for not being a dreamer and understanding what's possible. So um, I'm going to agree with what you're saying and just sort of take that a little bit further. So part of it is we have broken down, our families have bro been broken down, right? So, and then we also don't function as community anymore, right? So uh, when I, I look really young, but I'm not, but there was a time when, when your family, your nuclear family lacked something, you had this larger community that came in to try to fill the gaps, right? Um, and so that's one part of it. But the other part of it, I think, is uh, people like me who grew up in the community and didn't have a lot, and then we go, we graduate from the girls' eyes in the centrals, we go off to college, we get degrees, we better ourselves, and then we leave the community. Um, and then we don't come back and give to the our community opportunity. We don't open businesses in our community. We don't give jobs to people in our community. We don't mentor people in our community. So if you're a kid and you don't have a lot in your family, the question is what do you have to look up to, right? And, and the people who are actually there every day talking to you, um, engaging you, often are people who are involved in street stuff, right? And so if you're looking for something to do or who to be like and who to aspire to, there aren't as many people in the community to do that. There's not enough of us who have 
created opportunities, who have experiences, who are actually going back and mentoring and, and removing us. So my perspective on life changed dramatically when I moved out of Philadelphia. So even though I grew up and I went to Girls High and I had these experiences and we do this, you know, magnet school versus regular school and there is a difference, right? But there's also this huge difference when you're not in the city of Philadelphia and you start to become exposed to a world outside of that and you begin to dream and believe and you start recognizing, wait, like when I went to DC and I saw really, really professional black people who were in charge of stuff and they were CEOs, that changed my perspective. When I moved to Japan and I started meeting people and they didn't see me as less than just because of the color of my skin, I started to have a new perspective of what was possible and so it opened my mind to other things. So I think part of the reason that there is violence is because when I was a school teacher, my, my, I taught at a remedial disciplinary school. And my students used to say to me all the time, well, what is there to be for, right? So if I don't have anything to dream about, I live in the moment, I can't live in the future, and I'm not thinking about the consequences of what I do now. Um, but when you're surrounded by greatness, people who are doing, when you know these people on a regular basis and are talking to them, it actually does sort of open your mind to them. Surface level. Matter of fact, we just had this question in real talk, and I see some of the guys back there that commented on that particular question, and, and, it, and it seemed like the consistent consensus out of the young people was basically peer pressure. So it was what other people thought about them is why they wanted to fight carry a gun or respond in a violent manner to in a violent manner to how somebody approached them. So they were saying, look, you can't be a punk. So if somebody approaches you, you don't want to be seen as a punk in a neighborhood. So they revert to the crime. And, and we we talked about that in depth and I think that some of the young guys even know, you know, and I'm gonna keep it real because you know I'm from around the way. But you know, most of these guys aren't gangsters. They're not that the, the, the thug thug, so to speak. They want an education, they, they want to do the right thing, but so many things are coming at them from the community, from home, from school, and they just revert to, okay, I'm gonna be tough, I want people to know that I'm tough because this is the hood I grew up in. So we gotta give them different avenues. We actually work and uh, make them not be a part of it. They said jobs and things of that nature. What they, were, what they were saying, but it still lends itself to you have to keep up that image and that was bred in us for years as a people, even when we were coming up, you had to have a certain image to be on the streets of Philadelphia and I think that's something they are feeding into and we got to figure out a different avenue that they can take to say, you don't have to carry a gun to be tough, you don't have to carry a gun to succeed, actually it's something that's going to prevent you from succeeding in life. So I think they answered the question on a surface level, what is causing them to do that? And it's the peer pressure and trying not to appear to be a punk in the hood. And I think that's something we need to talk about on that level of where they yeah, I'll just briefly say that um, as of April 8th, we've seen a 13% increase in homicides um, this year. We've had uh, 87 homicides this year alone as of April 8th. I know according to my uh, colleagues, we've had at least six more since the eighth. Um, that's a lot, right? And I think that part of the challenge that we have to deal with um, is not only the question of poverty, which is uh, super important, all the things that come underneath poverty from education and everything else, um, but also our mental health. Uh, we've been in many ways uh, desensitized and normalized um, to the vast violence, the vast devastation, uh, and the normalcy of a very disgusting way of life. Um, and I think we gotta, you know, not sugarcoat it, as my brother said, we gotta, you know, if we want transformation, we gotta really hit it in the group. Um, the poverty is a serious part of it. Uh, I also believe that mental health is a serious part of it. 40% uh, of the folks who are incarcerated have a mental health condition. And part of the challenge that for many of our men and boys also, um, whether it be via schooling or otherwise, they're walking around with either a misdiagnosed or frankly an undiagnosed mental health condition. 
Um, and so we're talking about hyper violence, we're talking about hyper uh, uh, anxiety, anger issues, inability to cope with your stress, right? As you try to navigate th th these uh, experiences, we gotta look at how do we heal, and more importantly, how do we get to a frame of mind of mental health to be able to be a better neighbor, a better father, a better son, better in the workplace, better in school. Because without that, all these other ideas and things are gonna be compromised. Very different, very different issues and concerns. I'm finding so, so, many, so many different, mentality, different mentality. It seems, it seems, it seems hard. hard. It seems, it seems challenging. It's challenging. I don't say it's hard because the only thing hard, hard is we can't creep that we walk on everything, everything else. Is is a plus challenge. is a challenge. Um, um, so, so, so I'm ready. I'm ready for this ready challenge. For this and challenge. I was built, and I was built for this. this. I think that I think we, that we all have a purpose in life. And mine's and mine's going to take on its head that most that most of back away back away from that impossible. So people say it's impossible. I see possibilities. I don't see I don't see anything as being impossible.